Despite its physical splendor and charismatic wildlife, Yellowstone can be frustrating for visitors interested in exploring its famous volcanic features. Geysers, hot springs, and mud pools are abundant and easy to find, and all are interesting in their own right. But what about the big picture of the giant caldera, the massive lava flows, and the two massive resurgent domes? To the untrained eye, these iconic features can be hard to grasp, partly because they're almost too big to see. A quick geology history lesson will help us understand where to look. Nature abhors a vacuum is a common expression, and it's true in calderas, including Yellowstone. The Yellowstone caldera formed 631,000 years ago when a massive amount of rhyolite magma erupted explosively from a reservoir 5 to 10 kilometers, 3 to 6 miles, below the surface. The rapid removal of such a large volume caused the reservoir roof to collapse, and subsequent landslides into the abyss produced the outline of the caldera we see today, 50 kilometers by 70 kilometers. Such a distance is difficult for the human eye and mind to comprehend, but Yellowstone's magmatic system was not finished. Soon after the caldera collapsed, magma began refilling the partially drained reservoir. The increasing pressure lifted the caldera floor by hundreds of meters, yards, at two locations that had been the focus of the caldera forming eruption. The resulting bulges on the eastern side of the caldera became the revived Sour Creek Dome, and its sibling on the western side became the revived Mallard Lake Dome. Both features are elliptical in shape and more than 10 kilometers by 20 kilometers, 6 miles by 12 miles, with gently sloping sides. Resurgent domes differ from lava domes in that lava domes form primarily by the extrusion of viscous lava onto the surface, whereas resurgent domes form primarily by the uplift and deformation of the surface itself, driven by magma accumulating underground. The Sour Creek Dome rose to a height above the adjacent caldera rim before uplift there ceased. Its surface, like the Mallard Lake Dome, is cut by numerous faults that formed in response to intense uplift. Early post-caldera uplift may have also occurred at the Mallard Lake Dome site, although evidence for this is buried beneath younger deposits. Unlike the Sour Creek Dome, however, the Mallard Lake Dome underwent another episode of uplift about 170,000 years ago. Near the beginning of that episode, Mallard Lake rhyolite flows erupted from vents atop the dome covering much of its surface and adding to its volume. Thus, the resurgent Yellowstone domes are siblings, but not twins. One was formed entirely by structural uplift, the other by a combination of uplift and lava extrusion. The formation of the new dome in the western part of the caldera was followed by the extrusion of more than a dozen large rhyolite flows in a series of clustered eruptions from 170,000 to 70,000 years ago. These flows covered nearly the entire caldera floor and filled it to capacity in many places. The two exceptions are the towering upper flanks of the revived Mallard Lake and Sour Creek domes. So it's hard to see the revived calderas and domes for two reasons. They're so big that they're hard to spot among Yellowstone's many smaller attractions. And they're partly or mostly buried beneath relatively large lava flows. On a clear day, you can see the entire expanse of the caldera from accessible vantage points on its rim at Mount Washburn or Lake Butte. Don't be discouraged by the absence of deep, steaming cauldrons. Remember, nature has largely filled in the gaps with lava flows. With the help of interpretive signs or a geologic map, you might be able to find one of these lava flows, the elephant backflow, around Lahardy's Rapids. You can see another along Firehole Canyon Drive, where the interior of the flow has been exposed in cross-section by the erosive force of the Firehole River. And if you're looking for a resurgent dome, you can see the profile of Mallard Lakes Dome by looking west from the DeLacy Creek Trailhead along the Grand Loop, about halfway between West Thumb and Old Faithful. Sour Creek's dome is visible from several vantage points along the road between Canyon Village and Lake Village. Look east across the Yellowstone River to see its gently sloping profile on the horizon, reminiscent of the shape of Hawaii's shield volcanoes. With a little geological insight and a trained eye, you'll be able to spot Yellowstone's elusive volcanic giant.
Seismologists at the University of Utah have teamed up with other institutions to create an image of Yellowstone's magma reservoir using a technique called seismic tomography. By carefully examining data from thousands of earthquakes, they found that there are two magma reservoirs, one shallow and one deep, and both are much larger than previously thought. To create an image of the magma reservoir beneath Yellowstone, the research team looked at data from thousands of earthquakes. Seismic waves travel more slowly through hot, partially molten rock and faster through cooler, dense rock. The researchers mapped out the locations where seismic waves travel more slowly, providing a subsurface image of the hot or partially molten bodies in the crust beneath Yellowstone. The deeper magma reservoir extends from 20 to 50 kilometers, 12 to 31 miles deep, contains about 2% melt, and is about 4.5 times larger than the shallow magma body. Seismologists at the University of Utah, the University of New Mexico, and the California Institute of Technology published a 2015 study in the journal Science examining the magmatic connections between Yellowstone's deep mantle plume and its shallow crustal magma reservoir. To gain a deeper picture of Yellowstone's volcanic plumbing, the research team used earthquake recordings from the Yellowstone Seismic Network, along with seismic data from the EarthScope Transportable Array, a network of seismometers spanning the U.S. Yellowstone's seismic network has closely spaced seismometers that are better at imaging the shallower crust beneath Yellowstone, while data from the EarthScope seismometers is better at imaging deeper structures. The shallower magma reservoir is about 90 kilometers, 5.6 miles long, spans depths from 5 to 17 kilometers, 3.1 miles deep, and is 2.5 times larger than previous, less precise studies had suggested. In 2014, UU and seismologists at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology published the study in the Journal of Geophysical Research Letters. The magma reservoir contains about 5 to 15 percent molten rock, fluids, occupying the pore spaces between the solid, crystalline material. Although this is the crustal magma reservoir that has fueled Yellowstone's past volcanic activity, magma typically does not erupt unless it is more than 50 percent molten. It is important to note that this shallow, low-velocity body extends about 15 kilometers northeast of the caldera at depths shallower than 5 kilometers. This shallow northeastern region is likely due to the presence of hot water, other fluids, and gases escaping from the main body of the magma reservoir. The northeastward development of this magma system is consistent with the southwestward movement of the North American plate at approximately 2.35 centimeters per year over a plume of hotter mantle material, the Yellowstone hotspot, located about 60 to 90 kilometers below. The 20 to 50 kilometers magma reservoir is the primary link between the mantle plume, at depths up to approximately 60 kilometers, and the shallow crustal magma reservoir at depths of 5 to 15 kilometers. Most importantly, it provides a much more complete picture of the volcanic plumbing system at the Yellowstone hotspot and how magma and heat are transported from the mantle to the surface.